Did you know that two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? You do now. I sure did. I wish keeps have been around when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. It's too late for me. My hair's not coming back, but you don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss. So you might have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, mm, this is some sort of medicine, so it's going to be expensive, you couldn't be more wrong. Keeps starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one, thing there's no need to visit a doctor's office just schedule a quick online consult a little bit later a discreet package will arrive at your door and you can use it in the privacy of your own home so if you're noticing that you're losing your hair that's not going to fix itself i promise you that do something about it for a limited time go to keeps.com forward slash brain food or click the link in the description below to receive 50 percent off your first order and now today's video At 4.01 p.m. on January the 26th, 1972, a loud rumble like thunder tore through the skies over the small Czechoslovak village of Serbska Kamenice. J-80 Yugoslav Airlines Flight 367, bound from Copenhagen to Zagreb, had exploded at an altitude of 10,160 meters or 33,000 feet. Pieces of the McDonnell Douglas DC-9 rained down over the countryside, including a large section of the center of Uselage, which slammed into a snow-covered mountainside and slid into the valley below. First on the scene was Bruno Honker, a German woodsman from the village. As he explored the twisted wreckage, he grew increasingly certain that nobody could possibly have survived. But then, to his utter shock, he heard a loud moaning coming from inside. Peering into the fuselage, he spotted a young woman with blonde hair pinned against the wall by a food cart. Her turquoise stewardess's uniform soaked through with blood. Incredibly, she was alive. Her name was Vesna Volvovich, and to this day, she holds the world record for the highest freefall ever survived without a parachute. And this is her incredible story. Vesna Volvovich was born on January the 3rd, 1950 in Belgrade, in what was then the communist state of Yugoslavia. The daughter of a Serbian businessman and a fitness instructor, as a teenager, Volvovich fell in love with the music of the Beatles and became fascinated with the English language. Thus, upon graduating from grammar school in 1968, she enrolled at Belgrade University to study languages. But her dream was to live in London, as she recalled in a 2002 interview. At the end of my first year, I went to England to improve my command of the English language. I initially stayed with my parents' friends in Newbury, but wanted to move to to London. It was there that I met up with a friend who suggested we go to Stockholm. When I told my parents I was living in the Swedish capital, they thought of all the drugs and the sex and told me to come home at once. Back in Belgrade, I met a friend of mine in J80 uniform. She looked so nice and had just been to London for the day. I thought, why shouldn't I be an air hostess? I could go to London once a month. In 1971, Vulbovich joined Yugoslavensky Aerotransport, or JAT, Yugoslavia's flag carrier and largest airline. It was barely six months later that she found herself aboard Flight 367, bound from Stockholm to Belgrade, with stopovers in Copenhagen and Zagreb. Vulbovich was not even supposed to be on the flight, the airline having confused her with another stewardess who was named Vesna. Nonetheless, she was excited to travel to Denmark, having never visited the country before. But the mood among the flight crew was eerily tense and somber, as she later recalled, I actually had all the afternoon and the following morning free. I wanted to see the monuments, but my colleagues had a feeling that something would happen to them. Everybody wanted to buy something for his or her family, so I had to go shopping with them. They seemed to know that they would die. They didn't talk about it, but I saw. I felt for them. And the captain was locked in his room for 24 hours. He didn't want to go out at all. In the morning during breakfast, the co-pilot was talking about his son and daughter as if nobody else had a son or daughter. At 3.15 p.m. on January the 26th, 1972, JAT Flight 367 took off from Copenhagen with 28 people on board and headed south towards Zagreb. 46 minutes later, as the aircraft crossed from Germany into Czechoslovakia, a bomb exploded in the baggage compartment, tearing the DC-9 into three pieces. According to a later investigation, the other 27 passengers and crew were likely immediately sucked out of the aircraft and fell to their deaths. Vesna Vovovich, however, was pinned inside the center fuselage section by a food cart, allowing her to plummet 10,160 meters to the mountains below, where she was found hours later by Bruno Honka. Honka, who had been a German army medic during the Second World War, was able to keep Volvovich alive until rescue crews arrived. The crash left Volvovich with severe injuries, including a fractured skull, two broken legs, several broken ribs, and three shattered vertebrae, leaving her temporarily paralyzed from the waist down. From the crash site, she was first taken to a hospital in Prague, where she remained in a coma for several days. Then, on March the 12th, she was flown to Belgrade. There, her hospital room was placed under 24-hour armed guard, the authorities fearing that whoever had bombed the plane might want to eliminate the only surviving witness. The guards changed shift every six hours, and no one was allowed to visit Volvovich except for her parents and doctors. She remained 
hospitalized until June, whereupon she was sent to a seaside resort in Montenegro to recuperate. After undergoing multiple surgeries and months of physical therapy, Volvovich eventually regained the ability to walk, although for the rest of her life she'd walk with a pronounced limp. In total, Vesna Volvovich spent 16 months recuperating from her ordeal. Many explanations have been proposed to explain her extraordinary survival, such as the snow-covered hillside cushioning the impact of the fuselage section as it fell to earth. Doctors have also speculated that Volvovich's history of low blood pressure likely caused her to pass out the moment the aircraft pressurized, protecting her circulatory system from the shock of the subsequent impact. Indeed, Volvovich was aware of this problem prior to joining J-80 and feared that it would disqualify her from serving as a stewardess. She thus drank an excessive amount of coffee prior to her medical examination in order to raise her blood pressure. Volvovich also had speculated on the reasons for her survival, attributing her rapid recovery to her Serbian stubbornness and a childhood diet that included chocolate, spinach, and fish oil. Incredibly, soon after recovering from her injuries, Volvovich returned to work at J-80. The head injury sustained in the crash left her with no memory whatsoever of her ordeal, sparing her from the lingering PTSD that usually affects air crash survivors. Indeed, while being flown from Prague to Belgrade, the severely injured Volvovich was offered a sedative but refused, explaining that she had no fear of flying. In interviews, she even claimed to enjoy films featuring plane crashes. However, either out of superstition or fearing that her presence aboard flights would attract undue publicity, J-80 refused to allow her to continue serving as a flight attendant, instead giving her a desk job negotiating flight contracts. Nonetheless, Volvovich became a celebrity international hero throughout Yugoslavia, being decorated by Yugoslav President Josip Broz Tito, being made an honorary citizen of Srpska Kamenica, and immortalized in a song titled Vesna the Stewardess by folk singer Miroslav Ilic. Her rescuer, Bruno Honga, even named his newborn daughter Vesna in her honor. In 1985, Guinness World Records officially recognized Vesna Volvovich as having survived the longest recorded freefall without a parachute. In a touching fulfillment of a childhood dream, the Guinness Medal and certificate were presented to Volvovich by none other than her music idol, Sir Paul McCartney. The previous record for longest freefall was held by Soviet Air Force Lieutenant Ivan Chizov, who in January 1942 bailed out from his Aleutian Il-4 bomber at an altitude of 6,700 meters or 22,000 feet. Wishing to avoid becoming an easy target for marauding German fighters, Chizov waited to deploy his parachute until he had reached a lower altitude. Unfortunately, the thin air soon caused him to lose consciousness, and he was unable to pull his ripcord. Falling at a speed of between 190 and 240 kilometers an hour, Chisholm's body struck the edge of a deep snow-covered ravine and plowed its way to the bottom. There, he was discovered by a group of passing cavalrymen, severely injured but miraculously still alive. Like Vesna Volvovich, Chisholm made a complete recovery, later serving as a navigational trainer and propagandist for the Central House of the Soviet Army. Though no arrests were ever made, the bombing that brought down J-80 Flight 367 was eventually attributed to the Astasha, a Croatian ultranationalist group that collaborated with the Nazis during the Second World War and re-emerged afterwards as an underground terrorist group carrying out 128 terror attacks against Yugoslavian civilian and military targets between 1962 and 1982. Interestingly, Vesna Vovovic may have actually seen the bomber, recalling in 2002, We were waiting for the aircraft to arrive from Stockholm. As it was late, we were in the terminal and saw it park. I saw all the passengers and crew deep plane. One man seemed terribly annoyed. It was not only me that noticed him either. Other crew members saw him, as did the station manager in Copenhagen. I think it was the man who put the bomb in the baggage. I think he had checked in a bag in Stockholm, got off in Copenhagen, and never reboarded the flight. The last thing I remember is boarding the plane by the rear door and seeing a few women cleaning the plane. Two days after the crash of Flight 367, the Swedish newspaper Kralsposten received a phone call from a self-described Croatian nationalist claiming responsibility for the bombing. That was the official explanation anyway. But in 2009, Czech investigative journalist Peter Hornung and Pavel Feiner dropped a bombshell claiming that Volvovich's record-breaking fall was nothing more than Cold War propaganda. Based on secret documents supposedly obtained from the Czech Civil Aviation Authority, Hornung and Feiner concluded that J-80 Flight 367 had not, in fact, been blown up by a terrorist bomb but rather accidentally shot down by a Czech fighter jet, which had mistaken it for an enemy aircraft. The shoot-down, the journalist claimed, took place not at 10,160 meters, as in the official record of events, but at a much lower altitude of 800 meters. As evidence, Hornung and Thiner pointed to the relatively small size of the debris field, which they claimed was inconsistent with an explosion at a high altitude, as well as eyewitness accounts from residents of Srpska Kamenica, who claimed to have seen the plane intact but on fire below cloud level and to have spotted another aircraft, 
aircraft in the area. Equally compelling, if circumstantial, was the fact that at the time of the crash, Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev and East German leader Erich Honecker were flying home from a conference in Prague, meaning the Czechoslovak Air Force would have been on high alert. According to Horning and Steiner's theory, the Yugoslav and Czechoslovak secret police conspired to cover up the embarrassing incident, concocting the heroic story of Vesna Vovovich's record-breaking plunge to distract the public from the truth. As Peter Hornung stated in a 2009 interview, the Czechoslovak secret police managed to spread this wild tale throughout the world. No doubts have ever been expressed regarding the fall. The story was so good and so beautiful that no one thought to ask any questions. But as tantalizing as Hornung and Steiner's theory is, it is almost certainly false. Many of their claims rest upon the notion that the aircraft's black boxes were never found, or that the ones examined by authorities were fakes. However, the black boxes were in fact found and independently examined by forensic teams from Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and the Netherlands, who all confirmed that Flight 367 had indeed fallen from an altitude of 10,160 meters. But while Vesna Volvic's status as a national celebrity and hero was assured, the rest of her life was marked by tragedy and loss. Both her parents died within years of her ordeal, while in 1977 she married mechanical engineer Nicola Brecker. While doctors had assured her that her injuries would not affect her reproductive capacity, Volvovich suffered a near-fatal ectopic pregnancy and was never able to bear children. In the early 1990s, she and her husband divorced. Around the same time, Vesna was fired from JAT after 18 years of service for taking part in protests against Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic. She also avoided arrest only because the government feared the negative publicity her imprisonment would bring. Living on a meager pension in a rundown apartment building in Belgrade, Vovovic continued to participate in anti government protests until the Socialist Party of Serbia's overthrow in the bulldozer revolution of October 2000. She later campaigned on behalf of the Serbian Democratic Party and for Serbia's entry into the European Union. While she had no memory of her record breaking fall, Vulvovich nonetheless struggled for many years with survivor's guilt, turning to Orthodox Christianity to help her cope. Quote, Whenever I think of the accident, I have a prevailing, grave feeling of guilt for surviving it, and I cry. Then I think maybe. I should not have survived at all. But on the subject of her miraculous survival, Vulvovich was surprisingly unsentimental, stating in 2002, I'm not lucky. Everybody thinks I am lucky, but they are mistaken. If I were lucky, I would never have had this accident, and my mother and father would be alive. The accident ruined their lives too. Maybe I was born in the wrong place. Maybe it was a bad place. Then again, to die is pure destiny. In a plane, or in a car, or in the street. The funny thing is that if you have to die, the easiest way to do so is in a plane. So that's it. It was not my day for dying. It's destiny or fate. I could die now, crossing the street. When death finally came for Vesna Vovovich, it came quietly. On December 23, 2016, her friends became concerned when she suddenly stopped answering the telephone. Locksmiths were called in, and after forcing open her apartment door, they found her body sprawled out on the floor, dead from heart failure. She was 66. Vesna Volvich was buried four days later in Belgrade's new cemetery. Shortly before her death, Volvich neatly summarized her thoughts on survival, politics, and life as such. I am like a cat. I have had nine lives, but if nationalist forces in this country prevail, my heart will burst. I've never been interested in politics. I'm only interested in helping my nation survive. Everybody in the world thinks that Serbs are fighters and that Serbia is a bad nation. We are not like that. I am a Serbian and proud of it. So I was always asking people not to go to war and not to fight against Croats or Bosnians because we are all the same nation. We Serbians are true survivors. We survived communism, Tito, the war, poverty, NATO bombing, sanctions, and Milosevic. We only want a normal life. I just want a normal life.